In this lesson, we're going to cover the optical activity of chiral molecules. By the end of this lesson, you will learn how optical rotation works and how to understand polarimetry, how to calculate the specific rotation of a chiral compound, the concepts of enantiomerically pure samples, racemic mixtures, and mixtures with an enantiomeric excess, and finally, how to solve problems using the concept of percent enantiomeric excess. Let's get started. So if you have seen my other stereochemistry lessons, or if you've already learned about this in class, you know that a chiral molecule is a molecule that has a non-superimposable mirror image, and the two non-identical mirror images are called enantiomers of one another. So for example, R2-bromobutane and S2-bromobutane are enantiomers. Two enantiomers will pretty much behave exactly the same as each other in terms of their physical properties. So a set of two enantiomers will have the same boiling point and the same melting point. So both of these molecules, R2-bromobutane and S2-bromobutane, they both have a melting point of about negative 113 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 91 degrees Celsius. And so you can't really distinguish one enantiomer from another based on those properties. There's actually only one property that two enantiomers will exhibit differently, and that's the rotation of plane polarized light. So R2-bromobutane rotates the plane of polarized light negative 23.1 degrees under some standard conditions, while the S enantiomer rotates it positive 23.1 degrees. But what does this even mean? Light, or electromagnetic energy, is made up of waves that oscillate in all directions. So there might be waves oscillating up and down this way, so if my pen is a photon, that wave is oscillating up and down, or it might be oscillating from side to side as it comes towards you, or any direction in between. You can have waves oscillating in all directions. If we throw in a polarizing filter in front of our beam of light, it will only let through light that's oscillating in one direction. It will cancel out all the other directions of light. And that's what happens in an instrument called a polarimeter. The light begins at the light source, which is usually a sodium lamp with a fixed wavelength, and we call that the sodium D line. That light will travel through a polarizing filter, which only lets through light oscillating in one direction. Then that light will travel through a sample tube. So that's usually an organic compound dissolved in some sort of solvent inside a clear tube and the light will pass through that tube. If the organic compound inside the sample tube is chiral, it has this special ability to rotate the plane of the polarized light passing through the tube. So when the light gets to the other side of the tube, it's at an angle with respect to the original polarizer and this angle can be measured. Because only chiral molecules can do this, we call them optically active. The really cool thing is that each enantiomer of a chiral molecule will rotate the polarized light in the opposite direction. So one enantiomer will rotate the light to the right, and the other one would rotate it to the left. The same amount of rotation, but the opposite direction. So now those numbers from the earlier slide make a little bit more sense. The R enantiomer of 2-bromobutane rotates polarized light negative 23.1 degrees, or to the left, and the S enantiomer rotates the polarized light positive 23.1 degrees, or to the right. You will sometimes see chiral molecules named using a lowercase d or l, or a plus or minus in front of their names. This is in reference to how they rotate plane polarized light. D stands for dextrorotatory, it means that the light is rotated to the right, and the plus is also used for rotating light to the right. The L stands for levorotatory, and that means that the molecule would rotate the plane polarized light to the left, and the minus is also used for rotation in this direction. The important thing to know is that this kind of nomenclature, the D or L or the plus or minus, does not correlate with the R and S configurations of chirality centers at all. There's no relationship between those things. So even though we see here that the R configuration of 2-bromobutane can be called minus 2-bromobutane, that doesn't mean that all R configurations are minus. There's no relationship there. It's simply a naming convention. And it came before the R and S system was invented. It's sometimes still used, depending on if there's a need for it or not, depending on what the scientists are talking about, but 
What's important for you to know is that there's no relationship between plus minus DL and RNS configurations. If you have a chiral organic compound that's inside one of those polarimeter tubes and you want to take a measurement of how much it rotates the plane polarized light, the amount of rotation that you're going to see is going to depend on a few variables. So first, it's going to depend on how much of the compound that you have dissolved inside a solvent in the tube, so the concentration of that chiral molecule. The more molecules that there are in the tube, the higher the concentration and the more that the light is going to rotate. The rotation is also going to depend on how far the light is allowed to travel through the tube and rotate. So the longer it travels, the more it will rotate. We call this variable the path length. So a higher path length, a higher amount of rotation. The rotation can also depend on temperature and the wavelength of light that's used in the polarimeter. Because the amount of rotation is so sensitive to all of these variables, chemists decided on a way to standardize the measurement so that we can easily compare the optical rotations of different compounds. And we call this standardized measurement the specific rotation. The symbol for specific rotation is the symbol alpha inside of square brackets with the temperature and the wavelength of light used reported outside the brackets like this, with temperature on top and the wavelength on the bottom. Usually instead of a wavelength uh, in numbers, you'll just see the letter D at the bottom of the specific rotation symbol that represents the sodium D line. The specific rotation is calculated as the observed rotation, alpha, divided by the product of the path length and the concentration. The path length is always given in decimeters and the concentration is always in grams per milliliter. Here's a problem that we're going to work through so you can see how specific rotation is used. A sample has a concentration of 0.5 grams per mil and is placed in a polarimeter tube of length 5 centimeters. The resulting rotation at 20 degrees Celsius and using the sodium D line was plus 2.97 degrees. What is the specific rotation? So first let's write down what we know. We know that our observed rotation is positive 2.97 degrees. Our path length is five centimeters, but we need that to be in decimeters. So we're gonna multiply by one decimeter over 10 centimeters, and we get 0.5 decimeters. We also know that our concentration is 0.5 grams per milliliter, and that's already in the correct units. So we'll leave that as is. So we can now plug all of these things into our equation. So the specific rotation at 20 degrees and using the sodium D line, we abbreviate this by putting a 20 as a superscript and a D as a subscript beside our alpha here. This is equal to 2.97 divided by 0.5 times 0.5. And so when we plug those in, we get 11.88 degrees as our specific rotation. Although we usually just use degrees as our units for specific rotation, the actual units that you would get out of this calculation are shown below here. If I have a sample that contains only one enantiomer of a chiral molecule, we would call that sample enantiomerically pure or optically pure. So if I have a sample of R2-bromobutane and I go and take a polarimeter measurement, the specific rotation that I calculate from my measurement should match the literature value of negative 23.1 degrees. I would know then for sure that I have an optically pure sample of that R isomer. If I have a sample and I have exactly equal amounts of each of two enantiomers, we would call that a racemic mixture. If I took a measurement of this racemic mixture with a polarimeter to see what rotation I would get, I would actually get no rotation at all, no optical rotation. Because the sample is a 50-50 mixture, all the rotation caused by the R enantiomer would be cancelled out by all the rotation caused by the S enantiomer. The light will pass through the sample as it entered, unchanged. If I have a sample that is an unequal mixture of two enantiomers, so it's not 50-50 mixture, but it's not a pure 100% sample of just one enantiomer, we would call that sample enantiomerically enriched, or we would say that it has an enantiomeric excess. If I took a measurement of this sample's specific rotation, I would get a number that was in between zero and the specific rotation of a pure enantiomer. The sign of the rotation would be the same sign of whichever enantiomer was in excess in the mixture. 
Enantiomeric excess can be thought of as the percentage of the major enantiomer minus the percentage of the minor enantiomer. So in this picture here, there are 100 dots. The blue dots represent R2-bromobutane and the orange dots represent S2-bromobutane. 75% of them, 75 out of 100, are the R enantiomer, and 25 of them, 25%, are the S enantiomer. So we would say that the enantiomeric excess of this mixture is 50%. We have a 50% enantiomeric excess of the R isomer here. Another way of thinking about it is that 50% of the mixture is causing optical rotation and the other 50% is racemic, so it gives no rotation. We can also define the percent enantiomeric excess as 100 times the observed specific rotation of the mixture divided by the actual specific rotation of one of the pure enantiomers. And we use the absolute values here, so we always get a positive number. You might also see this calculation called optical purity. So with these two formulas, this one and the one on the previous page, we can predict what we expect a rotation to be if we know the ratio of enantiomers that we have, or we can find out the ratio of enantiomers we have if we take a rotation measurement of an unknown mixture, as long as we know the literature values for the specific rotations. So I'll show you what I mean here. Let's go back to that mixture that had a 50% enantiomeric excess of the R2-bromobutane enantiomer. If we use the literature value of the specific rotation for R2-bromobutane, which is negative 23 0.1 degrees, we would be able to predict that we will have an observed specific rotation for this mixture of 11.55 degrees, and then we would change the sign to negative, negative 11.55 degrees, because we know that the R enantiomer is the major one and that it has a negative sign for its rotation. So if we had this mixture, we would observe a specific rotation of 11, negative 11.55 degrees. Lastly, you might also see percent enantiomeric excess expressed in terms of the concentrations of each enantiomer, like this. Percent enantiomeric excess equals 100 times the concentration of the major enantiomer minus the concentration of the minor enantiomer over the concentration of both enantiomers, or the total concentration. So let's do some practice problems to make sure we've got all this. Feel free to pause the video at the beginning of each problem and try them yourself first. First, the hormone progesterone has a specific rotation of 172 degrees. If 200 milligrams of progesterone is dissolved in 10 milliliters of a solvent and placed in a 5 centimeter sample tube, what observed rotation is expected? Here we're being asked for the observed rotation when we're given some conditions about the amount of compound in the path length as well as the literature value for specific rotation. So we're going to use the formula for specific rotation. We know our literature value is plus 172 degrees. We have 200 milligrams of progesterone in 10 milliliters. So we'll get the concentration here by taking our 20 milligrams and we're going to turn that into grams by multiplying by one gram over 1000 milligrams. And that gives us 0.02 grams per milliliter. We're given the length of the sample tube in centimeters, but it needs to be in decimeters. So we just multiply five centimeters by one decimeter over 10 centimeters and we get 0.5 decimeters. And so now we can solve for our observed rotation. If we rearrange the formula, we can get our observed rotation is the product of the specific rotation and the concentration and the path length. We just multiply those three together and we get 1.72 degrees. Here's our second problem. A mixture of D-glucose and its enantiomer L-glucose was found to have a specific rotation of 35.4 degrees. Given that the specific rotation of pure D-glucose is 52.7 degrees, we're being asked A, what is the percent enantiomeric excess of the solution? And B, what percentage of the L-glucose enantiomer is present in the solution? So let's start with A. We know that one of the ways that we can find percent enantiomeric excess is to take the observed specific rotation of the mixture and divide that by the known specific rotation of the pure enantiomer. So 
we can do that. We have our mixture, the specific rotation was 35.4 degrees. So we'll divide that by the pure value for D glucose, 52.7 degrees, and multiply that by 100. And that gives us 67.2% in antiomeric excess of D glucose. And we know that D glucose is definitely the one that was in excess here because our observed rotation was positive and so is the literature value for the D glucose that was also positive. So B is asking us to calculate the percentage of the L isomer that we have in solution. So we know that the enantiomeric excess is 67.2 degrees. So let's think about what that means again. It means that 67.2% of the mixture is excess D enantiomer and the rest is 50-50, so a racemic mixture. So if we take 100 minus 67.2, we get 32.8%. So that other 32.8% that is not the excess is the racemic mixture. That part of the solution is a racemic mixture. And so if we divide that by two, 32.8 divided by two, that means that we have in that portion of the solution, 16.4% of each of the enantiomers. So the total amount of the D isomer, D glucose, would be the 67.2% that was in excess, plus that extra 16.4% from the racemic part for a total of 83.6%. And the percentage of L glucose would just only be that 16.4%. And that is it for this lesson. I'll see you in the next one.